Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at Christ Community Church today. And our children are dismissed now, uh, kindergarten through, <laughs> through fifth grade for Children's Church. If you want to head that direction. Oh, Kim was not kidding. There are a lot of jerseys here today. <laughs> I guess it's football season, right? You can tell by just by how everybody's dressed this morning. Uh, I was telling Kim before the service, I kind of feel left out. I wish I had a jersey myself. Um, but I was born and raised in Michigan, so born and raised, unfortunately, as a Detroit Lions fan. And so I made a commitment a long time ago to not give them a lot of money because that would only encourage them. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I am wearing my University of Michigan socks this morning, so still, still a football fan today, I guess. Um, but you know, that's the thing is, when you are a, a fan, when you follow a team, whether it's football, baseball, whatever else, you know, there's an expectation, I think, that that, that following might kind of come in waves over time. You know, some people are diehard, they're going to be there, they're going to buy the season tickets no matter what, and stand by their team no matter what. Uh, but for a lot of us, you know, if, if the team's doing well, we find ourselves a little bit more interested, we're paying a little more attention, and if they're not doing as well, it's just a little bit easier to ignore them, you know, for a couple of years or, or decades maybe, depending on, on what team you're following. Uh, maybe at the start of the season, you know, we, we're, we're really excited about, about the, you know, the prospects, and then as the season wears on, just our, you know, if the team's doing well, we stay with it, and if they're not, then, you know, we might drop off a little bit. And that's just sort of the nature of what it means to follow in our day and age. In fact, when it comes to other things, following might just mean uh, that you clicked like on something on social media. You know, that's, that's the extent of what it means to follow. Uh, but we're in a series right now called Come and See, where we're talking about what it means to follow Jesus. And, and we're talking about something a little bit different, a little bit more in depth than simply, you know, kind of coming along for the ride for, for various seasons of, of your faith, or, or as little as you know, just deciding I like this or I'm going to click and follow this. We're talking about something a little bit different here. Um, so we've been looking at some stories of the disciples, of the first followers of Jesus, and how they went from people in the crowd. You know, there were thousands of people that crowded around Jesus and wanted to hear him, but yet the smaller number actually followed him. And so what was the difference between the people in the crowd versus the people who were really following? And last week we talked about this idea of it starts with the invitation to come and see. So be willing to set aside your doubts long enough to just check Jesus out and see what he has to offer. And what we talked about was that if we are willing to do that, Jesus shows us far greater things than simply removing our doubts. And the story that we're going to be looking at this morning, it's in the book of Matthew chapter 8, if you want to follow along today. Uh, your, your Bible might title this, Jesus Calms the Storm. I want to just start by reading this, this text, these few verses, uh, Matthew 28, starting in verse 23. We're going to read it um, and see, first of all, how it's an example of the greater things that the disciples were beginning to see by following Jesus. But then we want to take some time to dive into the text a little bit deeper. So it says, starting in verse 23, Then he got into the boat, that's Jesus, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. A lot of you might be familiar with that story. It's one of the more famous stories of Jesus. So if you've heard that before, you, know, you might think this is a story that shows how powerful Jesus was, or this is a story that shows the miracles that he could do. But I want to suggest this morning that even more so than, than those aspects of the story, this is really a story of what it means to be a disciple and what it means to follow Jesus. And I think what this this uh, text is showing us is that being a disciple means following Jesus and growing in trust of him along the way. And it's when we look at this story in its broader context that we can understand that it really at its heart is a story about discipleship. See, when, when you're reading scripture, it's always important to try to understand that piece of scripture within the context, within the bigger picture that it falls in. 
Because even though we can take some, some truth out of this story just by reading those verses, when you understand the bigger picture, you start to see how it fits into the overall story, into the overall point of what the book of, that, of the Bible or what the Bible as a whole is all about. So I always want to encourage that, you know, to take a step back. What is, what is the surrounding context here? What, is, what else is going on that led us to this point? And so if we zoom out quite a bit here in the book of Matthew, we find that in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is delivering a sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, in fact, our, our last series uh, where we talked about the Beatitudes, our series is called Bless. That is the very beginning of that sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. But it goes on for three chapters. And it ends at the end of chapter 7 with this verse, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. And then it goes on as we get to the beginning of chapter 8, where this story of Jesus calming the storm comes in. It says, When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. So these crowds of people that had gathered to hear Jesus teach, they still are following him after he leaves the mountain. And that's where we begin a context of the story. So the first thing is that anyone can follow Jesus. Anybody can. There's crowds, thousands of people that are following him at this point, and they, they follow him off of the mountain after his teaching. They're amazed by the teaching. They, they continue to follow him. And it, and it looks like no, there's no attempt made by Jesus to stop them. You know, he's not standing back and saying, hey, wait a second, you know, are you, are you really followers or do you really understand what you're doing? You know, he doesn't try to send the crowd away. He lets them follow. You know, it's sort of like our, how our, our, our allegiance to a, a sports team might be at times. You know, if you go to the store and you want to buy a, a Packers jersey or a Bears jersey or whatever other team, it's not like when you get to the checkout, the person's like, now hold on a minute, do you really like this team or not? You know, are you really going to follow them? They, they don't make you take a vow like when you're getting married. You know, do you promise to follow the Chicago Bears in sickness and in health and winning seasons and in losing seasons? <laughs> you might, you might, but nobody's going to stop you from buying the jersey, right? Maybe some other people might accuse you of being a Fairweather fan or something like that but you're allowed to follow. And in a similar sense, the crowds are now following Jesus, and he, he's not telling them that they can't follow. He's allowing them to come along and witness the things he's about to do. And we won't read the entire chapter, but what we end up seeing here is that following this sermon, Jesus goes around and he's doing all of these miracles. He, he heals the servant of this centurion. Um, he he uh, heals a man that has leprosy. He actually heals Peter's mother-in-law, and then it says he heals many other people. And all the while, the crowd has built up around him, and they're seeing him do this. And here's the thing, is that it's, it's easy to follow Jesus when things are, are like that. You know, when he's right there in your town, and he's doing miracles, and everything is going well, it's easy to follow Jesus. Um, but, but what about when, when uh, the stakes get raised? So we'll get there in a moment. But the first thing, though, that we can learn, the first challenge we can take out of this is simply follow Jesus. You can follow Jesus from wherever you are. You can follow Jesus regardless of your history or regardless of the mistakes or the sins you've done in the past. Uh, we don't know the stories of all these people in the crowd. You know, the disciples didn't vet them. They didn't, you know, try to figure out, you know, who is, who is a good person and who's not, who has a bad history and who doesn't. They were just allowed to gather around Jesus and they were allowed to follow Jesus. And the same is true for us today that we can gather around Jesus no matter what our past looks like, no matter how much knowledge of him we already have, we can follow him. And that's where it starts. But here's the thing is that as we follow Jesus, he raises the bar. So he might allow us to follow from wherever we come from, but he is going to start to up the ante for us. He's going to start asking us to do things as we continue to follow him. Uh, a, a pastor of, of Jen and mine from when we first met, he actually passed away recently. And this was a, something I remember him talking about a lot. He would say something to this effect that God will meet you where you are, but he doesn't want you to stay there. Or God loves you. Uh, God loves you no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. He loves you, but he also loves you too much to let you stay that way. He wants you to grow. He wants you to overcome your sins, to overcome your past, to, to grow in your faithfulness to him and in, as a person who is following him. And so we see this in this chapter, that Jesus is going to start raising the bar for those that are trying to follow him, for these people in the crowd. 
Uh, we come down to verse 18, and it says, When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Now, we could take this in two ways, because it says that his order to cross the lake, so they're, they're on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and they're about to cross over to the other side. And we could look at this, um, because it says that he saw the crowd and then he gave this order, then on one hand, maybe it's him saying, hey, I want to get away from all these people. You know, I've been surrounded by this crowd for a few days now. I've been preaching to them. They've been watching me do miracles. They're pressing on me. I just need my space. You know, we could look at it that way. But I think it might actually, based, again, based on the context here, might be better to look at this as Jesus is giving this crowd an invitation. All right, you followed me when things were easy. You followed when I was teaching and when I was doing miracles and when I was here in your hometown. But will you keep following me if I ask you to cross the lake? And first of all, the reason I think that, that this is an invitation is because when you get to the other side of the lake, so if you read you know, toward the end of, of Matthew chapter 8, and if you get into chapter 9, you start to see Jesus um, not only doing miracles on the other side of the lake, but he starts to challenge the religious authorities. And he starts to answer tough questions. And you can see where the bar has been raised a bit on what Jesus is doing. He's starting to uh, disrupt the status quo on the other side of the lake. He's not just doing miracles. He's doing miracles and he's giving some harder teachings. But also in the response right after this is where I think that we can take this as a challenge from Jesus to follow along with him. Because as soon as he gives the order to cross the lake, it says in verse 19, a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. We get two examples here of would-be followers of Jesus. So the first one is this over-enthusiastic uh, potential follower. And he says, Jesus, I will follow you anywhere. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So this, this first guy is super enthusiastic because, I mean, he's been witnessing Jesus doing miracles and doing all these teachings, but he doesn't really know what he's getting into. And so when he says, Jesus, I would follow you anywhere, Jesus now lays out the difficulty of following him. He's basically saying, if you follow me, you know, we're, we're just wandering here. We're going to cross the lake. We don't have a place to stay. You know, like animals even have places to stay, but I, I don't have a, a bed to lay down in at the end of the night. We're just going to go, you know, wherever the day takes us. And we can assume, just, just based on the fact that it doesn't say this man follows Jesus, we're left to, to assume that he didn't follow at that point. So his enthusiasm starts really high, but as soon as he gets some information about what it means, his enthusiasm drops off. Now, the second guy is almost the opposite. It says another disciple. So it's not necessarily saying one of the 12 disciples, but someone who, is, who has been learning under Jesus at some point, in some capacity here, said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. So in other words, this, the second person is, is the opposite. He is unenthusiastic. He's or under-enthusiastic, at least. Uh, he, he has this realization that, that there is going to be a cost to following Jesus. And so now he's trying to minimize that cost. He's saying, Jesus, I want to be able to go bury my father first. Now, this, this might come across as a little unsympathetic on Jesus' part, like, hey, the guy's dad just died. Let him go bury his father. Um, it, it might also, though, imply that he's saying his father hasn't even died, and he wants to just wait until that happens and you know, sort of settle the estate. He's saying, give me, give me more time. You know, let, let me be able to take care of some of these affairs in my family. And Jesus is saying, look, you know, other people can take care of that. Whatever the situation here, let the rest of the family deal with it. But if you really want to follow me, there's going to be a cost. You're going to miss out on some, some things that you would have wanted to be a part of. You might miss on time with your family, or you might miss out on certain experiences, or being able to, you know, do certain things if you're going to follow me. But if you're going to follow, just, just go and follow. So the first guy is over-enthusiastic. And when he gets the reality, he, he uh, decides not to follow. The second guy is, is unenthusiastic. He, he, his enthusiasm doesn't match what he knows about Jesus, um, that Jesus is going to ask him some things. And so he chooses not to follow either. And so, again, you see that when Jesus gives this invitation to no longer just stand here in your hometown and watch me do miracles, but are you willing to cross the lake, people start to drop off at this point. You know, the, the over-enthusiastic one, the under-enthusiastic one, they're not following anymore. But then we get into the story that, that we just read a few minutes ago. Verse 23, then Jesus got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Notice that Jesus steps into the boat first and the disciples follow. And I want to backtrack a second. So again, it's easier to follow Jesus when he's close and when times are good. It's harder to follow him when he raises the bar. So my challenge here for you in this next part of the story is 
when Jesus raises the bar, just go. It might be difficult. It might, he might be asking you something that's uncomfortable or something that is going to cost you something. But if Jesus is asking you, and if you want to be a disciple, just go. Whatever he might be calling you into right now, if there's a ministry that you're feeling uh, nudged toward, if there's someone that, that you feel like Jesus is, is, in, is uh, wanting you to share your faith with, if there are ways that he wants you to, to raise the bar within your family and be more of a, a leader or a spiritual figure within your home or, or to your, your friends and family or, or your other relatives, if Jesus is asking you to do something, do it. It's time to go. And that's what his disciples do. They, Jesus gets in the boat first, and his disciples are the ones that follow him. Now here's the next part, though, is that following Jesus does not mean smooth sailing. Pun totally, completely intended there. His disciples get in the boat. They follow Jesus. And you know what? They're probably thinking, you know, this is, first of all, they're thinking the, the, the journey across the lake, it's, you know, it's just a formality. You know, when you go on a vacation and you have to get in the car and drive for a few hours, you have to get on a flight, you know, for the most part, that's not the vacation. That's not the part you're necessarily looking forward to. That's the formality to get to where you're going. You know, and so when you tell the story afterward of your vacation or of your trip, you don't usually even include that part. Well, first I got in the car and I drove for three hours. Let me tell you all about that. All right, I got on a flight and, and we, we took off and we landed safely. And, you know, you don't usually really talk about that part. It's sort of a, a footnote in the story. And I'm, a, I'm guessing that that's what the disciples are thinking. We're going to get in this boat, we're going to go to the other side of the lake, and we're going to see what else Jesus has for us over there. But, but the journey itself across the lake, this is an act of discipleship as well. This is a teaching moment for Jesus. And the thing is, is that even with Jesus in the boat, there's, there's a storm. The disciples, again, are, are probably thinking, I mean, you know, it's not like storms were unheard of. But they're thinking, we've got Jesus in the boat. You know, everything's going to be fine. But the storm comes anyway, with Jesus right there alongside of them. You know, this sort of goes back to um, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus gives the story of a wise, fool, or a wise builder and a foolish builder. The wise builder makes his house on the rock, the foolish builder makes his house in the sand, and then the storm comes and the, the house on the rock stands, the house on the sand falls down. But the reality is that the storm hits both of them. Following Jesus is not a promise that there's not going to be storms. And we see this in reality right here, that Jesus gets on the boat with the disciples and there is still a storm. And it's an intense storm. It says, a furious storm came up on the lake. The, the Greek word for the storm, it's seiz, seismos, like the, where we get the word um, uh, seismic. You know, which we usually use that word to refer to earthquakes. It refers to a, a great shaking, usually of the ground. But in this case, it's a great shaking of the water. And so I think this word is chosen to describe the fact that the water itself is just chaotic in this situation. You know, there, there's huge waves that says they're washing up over the boat. And at this point, we don't know exactly which of the disciples are following Jesus, which of the 12. We know a few of them are still going to follow after this point. But we do know that Andrew and Peter and James and John are disciples of Jesus at this point. And those four guys were, were professional fishermen. And even though four professional fishermen who, who made their living on the Sea of Galilee are in this boat, they're terrified. So that should go to show us how ferocious this storm was. And they might even be thinking, how is this possible? We have Jesus with us. He's the one who told us to get in the boat. We followed him. Why did he lead us into the storm? It says the disciples went and woke him. Jesus is asleep. In fact, in, the, in Mark's account of the story, it says he was asleep in the stern of the boat on a pillow. You know, Jesus got comfortable. Um, and so the disciples have to go and wake him. Now, throughout the Old Testament, there's a lot of, a lot of places where when, when someone, like in the Psalms, for example, is questioning, you know, God, are you there? God, are you paying attention? A lot of times they use this metaphor, God, are you sleeping? You know, I'm going through all these difficulties, all these troubles, and you're not rescuing me, so you must be asleep. You know, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's asleep in the boat. But at the same time, you know, how, how is it that we can sleep, right? Like when, when we're worried, that, that's usually when I, I have a, a sleepless night. You know, to be able to sleep means that, that you have been able to set your worries and your anxieties aside and, and you're able to just, you know, get some rest, some much, much needed, much deserved rest. So the fact that Jesus is asleep goes to show how content he is in his relationship with the Father. The storm is not bothering him. He is not at all worried that he's going to drown. He's not anxious. He is totally at peace. He's, he's sound asleep in this boat, but the disciples go and they wake him up. Again, they, they weren't expecting this to happen. So here's the thing, though, guys, is that uh, the, the challenge, I think, in this, at this point 
in the narrative here is that when, when these challenges do come, when storms in life approach us, don't give up on Jesus just because the storms came. We're never, again, we're never promised that there won't be difficulty in life, that we won't face trials, that we won't have storms, literal or, or metaphorical, just because we follow Jesus. The, the problem is, is that a lot of people at this point, that's when they give up on their faith. They think, well, I, I follow Jesus, and therefore everything should, have, everything should have been perfect for me. And the fact that it's not means that, that Jesus, he's not pulling his weight, or, or Jesus isn't doing uh, what I thought he was going to do. And it's not that Jesus is not doing what he's supposed to be doing. It's that maybe we have, we have uh, started off with the wrong expectations. He never promised us that there wouldn't be storms. He never said that there's not going to be difficulties, that to be a Christian means that life is going to be easy. And so if, if that is how we went into our faith, I accepted Christ so that life will be easy, then we have gone in with the wrong expectations. Instead, what Jesus promises is that he is going to be there with us through the storm. He's going to help us to endure it. Um, and so that's what we see as the story continues. So finally, our trust in Jesus should grow as our understanding of Jesus grows. That's ultimately what the story is teaching us here. Remember back to those other two disciples, the ones that didn't get in the boat. The first one had these high expectations or, or this high level of enthusiasm, but it was based on, on, ex, or on, on assumptions, on false assumptions. And as soon as Jesus gave him the reality that following me might be difficult, his enthusiasm dropped and he didn't want to follow anymore. The other guy was, again, in the opposite boat. He, he, um, he had very low enthusiasm because he knew that there was a cost. And he was just wanting Jesus to minimize that cost as much as possible. But the reality is that if we are true followers of Jesus, our enthusiasm should increase as our understanding of who Jesus is increases. See, the disciples in this boat, they, they had faith, but it was, it was a weak faith because they didn't know yet who Jesus really was. So it's not that their faith is not genuine, it's that their faith needed to grow. It needed to um, be more understanding of Jesus. So look at what happens. So they, they cry out to Jesus, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. So Jesus wakes up and he replies, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Again, they're terrified. Why are they afraid? They're afraid because they think that there's going to be a, a wave that knocks their boat over and they're all going to drown at sea. So they, they think they've got a valid reason to be terrified and they're asking Jesus to bail them out. But notice this. Before Jesus does anything about the storm, what's the first thing he does? He addresses their faith. For Jesus, the bigger problem here is not the storm. The bigger problem is that this be a teaching moment for his disciples, that their faith needs to grow. The first, the first problem is grow your faith, and then the storm, that's of second importance. That doesn't matter nearly as much as that in this moment, your faith grows. And so they're left with this question, you know, why are we afraid? We have, we have Jesus in the boat. What are, what are we terrified of? And then it says, Jesus got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. So he asked the question first, why do you have such little faith? You know, why are you afraid? And then he puts on this impressive, amazing display of his power. He speaks to the storm and the, the wind and the waves calm down. And even though he doesn't now start to preach a sermon to his disciples about what this means, I think they get the implications of this. Because all throughout the Old Testament, really, and even just logic would tell us, who has the power over the wind and the waves? God and God alone. You know, God is the one that, that spoke creation into existence in the first place. And we're told in Genesis that God came to Adam and Eve in the, our, our translations say, in the cool of the day. The actual Hebrew says the, the ruach of the day. It's the same word as wind or spirit. So the wind of the day. The reason we translate that cool of the day is because that doesn't make a lot of sense in the English language. And so we think, well, that must be the, the cool time, you know, when there's the gentle morning breeze, the cool of the day. But notice that God, or that, you know, the, the text is using that word, the wind. God is speaking to Adam and Eve in the wind of the day. Later on in the book of Job, Job 38, God speaks to Job, and it says he speaks out of the whirlwind. So God is there in the, in the gentle breeze, in the cool morning wind with Adam and Eve. He's there in the whirlwind or in the storm with Job. In the book of Jonah, God is the one that sends the storm to get Jonah's attention. He's also the same one that calms the storm. He's the one that splits the Red Sea in half. He's the one that was in control over the waters of the flood. 
God and God alone is in control of the wind and of the waves. And so for Jesus to stand up and speak, just like God did at creation, speak to the wind and the waves and say, be calm, and it listens to him, what is that saying about him? And the disciples catch on to this. It says, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Their understanding at this point, this is not an ordinary man. This is a man with incredible ability that only God can have. They're starting to grasp at this point that this is God in the flesh. They're going to continue to have to learn this lesson as the gospel continues, but they're starting to get it right now. This is not just an ordinary person. And so as their understanding of who Jesus is is increasing, their enthusiasm about following him is now increasing. Their willingness to go where he goes is increasing. And that's exactly how this should be with us. As we understand who Jesus is, our our ability and our willingness to follow him should increase. He's raising the bar and we should be following it because of who he is. Now here's the question. What is the thing that they needed to understand the most in this story? It's the fact that Jesus is our only Savior. Because he is God in the flesh. Because he can do what only God can do. He is the only one that can save us. You know, and I think that this is true for us as well. If we want to be followers of Jesus, this is the main thing we need to understand. Is that he is not only our Savior, he is our only Savior. He's the one who saves us from our sin. He saves us from death, from eternal death. But he saves us every day as well. He is the only one who offers real hope for our world. You know, and so we look around at the world around us and and we can look at all the ways that, you know, things are falling apart or things are are getting worse. You know, and, and a lot of times in those situations, we turn to all sorts of different places looking for rescue. We might turn to a politician. You know, if we vote for the right people, then they will fix this. Or we turn to a business leader. You know, if we, if we support their business, you know, maybe they'll pour back into the community and they'll, they'll provide the funds that we need to, to fix our town. Or, or we trust in ourselves and our own ability to provide for ourselves and to, um, to make ourselves a living so that even if the world around me falls apart, I can, you know, hedge myself in with, you know, in my own little estate here and I can be safe. Or we, we might look to a, a family member. You know, maybe you have that one person in the family that they always come in and save the day. You know, if you get yourself in trouble, they're going to bail you out or, or they're going to be there to help. And so we look to all these other people, all these other entities, even ourselves, for our rescue when the reality is, is that the only one who's ever really going to save us is Jesus. None of the, the politicians, none of the leaders, none of our family members, not even ourselves can save us in the way that Jesus will ultimately save us. He saves us from our sin, he saves us from death, and he saves us in each moment as we continue to put our trust in him. He's the one that has control over the wind and the waves, so doesn't he also have control over the situations that we go through? And no, that doesn't mean that it's going to be easier if you just follow Jesus, that you're not going to face difficulty. But what he's promising here is that he is with us through the storm, whatever that might look like. He's the one that is sustaining us and is giving us the ability to endure it and to learn from it so that our faith in him can grow, just as it does for the disciples here. So our challenge here is to, again, um, to not, well, I I got myself, or I backtracked a little bit, Uh, don't give up on Jesus through those storms, but also to continue to learn from Jesus as we, as we grow in our understanding of him. Now here's the thing is that there's, there's two main ways, and this text shows us this, there's two main ways that we can grow in our understanding. And the first is to listen to his teaching. So again, we go all the way back to Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Jesus teaches these people, um, and he's he's giving us teaching straight from God. He is God in the flesh. And it says the people were amazed at his teaching. We can learn from Jesus' teaching as well. We have scripture. We have this incredible privilege, this incredible opportunity that, that we can take the Bible home with us. We can have it with us at any time, any place, whether it's in a a printed version like this, or you can download it on your phone. There has been no point in human history where we have had as easy access to the Bible as we have in this day and age. And so we can have his teachings. We can read it for ourselves. I always encourage you with that. Don't just take my word for it. Read the Bible for yourself. Study it for yourself. Learn from it. Grow as a result of it. We hear Jesus' teachings all through this book. And so that is one way that we grow in our understanding of him. And as we grow, we should be trusting him more. But we also grow by experiencing him in action. That's what the disciples did. They, they had just heard the Sermon on the Mount. They had heard Jesus 
you know, give this incredible teaching. And now here they are in the boat and they have an opportunity to put that into practice. You know, Jesus has just talked to them about not worrying and not being anxious and to, you know, give your cares and your anxieties to him. And here they are in a boat with Jesus and they're worrying and they're afraid that they're going to die. They, they have an opportunity to put what they have learned into practice and, and they're struggling. And Jesus has to remind them where their faith is supposed to be. So here's the thing is that we have the same opportunity. We should be learning by reading scripture for ourselves, by studying it and coming together in small groups or at church or in all these uh, different capacities, Bible studies, to learn this word. But then as we go out into the world, that's like leaving the classroom and getting into real life, where now you have an opportunity to put the things into practice that you have been learning and to watch Jesus in action. So when you're out there, in, outside the classroom, in the real world, are you going to trust Jesus based on the things that you've learned, based on the things that he has said, or are you going to be like the disciples in the boat, terrified that, that we're not going to make it through this time? This is our opportunity. So grow in him, both in your time with him in his word, at church, in small group, and Bible study, but also grow by allowing him to speak to you through those experiences and watching him in action and growing your faith in those moments. So again, being a disciple means following Jesus, but then growing in trust in him along the way. Wherever you are at in your, in your faith journey, whether you are, are just coming and seeing Jesus for the first time, or, or whether you have been a Christian for years and you have read the Bible and you've memorized verses, or any point in between, you still can grow in your trust of Jesus. Being a disciple doesn't mean you have reached a certain threshold, you know, you, you've crossed through a certain barrier and now we call you a disciple. It just means that you are willing to go the next step. That as Jesus is raising the bar, you're willing to go over that bar with him and continue to grow and continue to build that trust. So I want to encourage you this morning that wherever you are at in that journey, you can take the next step. Place your faith in Jesus. Trust in him. Trust your life to him. But continue to trust him. Trust him by reading his word and, and trying to understand it. Trust him by putting that into practice in the world around you and continue to grow that trust every day. Let me pray for you. Holy Father, we thank you that you did come in the flesh and that, that we have the example of your son Jesus to look to. We thank you that even though we do experience storms and difficulties in life, you are there with us, that you promise to be there, to guide us, um, to to teach us that all of those storms can be learning opportunities and growth opportunities. And so as we do look at the world around us and all of its difficulties, and we see the ways that the, the world has rejected you, or we, we have just personal problems in our own lives, help us to trust you, to know who you are more because of the word that you have given us, your, your Bible, but also help us to trust you as we see you in action, working through those situations. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite the band back up. We're going to sing one last song this morning uh, that, that ties into this, this teaching um, or this story from Matthew. It's called uh, The Eye of the Storm. So would you stand with us and we'll continue worshiping this morning.